let me just uh, you know kind of restate this because uh, you know Bill Black was pretty unambiguous that uh, Bill Clinton's 1993 reinventing government initiative, which he put Al Gore in charge of, by the way, if you'll recall, those of you old enough to remember the early years of the Clinton administration. A large part of that had to do with deregulating the banks and, and you know, cutting back on, on agencies in the government. You know, it was a very, very kind of Republican concern. This is the New Democrats. And so the genesis of today's disastrous economy and the crash and everything really, you know, it was put on steroids, certainly by, by, by Phil Graham with Graham Leach Bliley and the Commodity Futures Modernization Act. But Bill Clinton enthusiastically signed both of those, too. But back in 93, he was doing Robert Rubert's work and Alan Greenspan's, you know, deregulating the banks. And so somebody calls up and says, well, you know, given that, and how Bill Clinton has managed to make himself into a multimillionaire now since he left the, the White House. How could you possibly support a Hillary candidacy? And my point, and I, I, and I, we need to remind ourselves of this over and over and over again. There's no saviors. We have to save ourselves. This salvationistic thinking that is part and parcel, frankly, of most of our major religions. Jesus is going to return, say the Christians. Mashiach is, you know, coming back, say the Jews, uh, some of them. Uh, Muhammad is going to return, say some Muslims. I mean, you know, this, uh, this messianic, somebody will save us, thinking, migrates into our political world, and we see it in the in the business world. Oh, you, you know, it's it, this is how they sell us the whole this the myth of the job creator, this nonsense about job creators. Oh yeah, hey, you know, if we if only the right guy would take over our company or would start a company. If only another Steve Jobs came along. Well, did you know that Steve Jobs was colluding with a couple of other companies to to drive down wages in Silicon Valley and screw workers? So, yeah. Yeah, Louise just walked in and said, if only Obama would become president, we were all saying this in 2008, then everything will be perfect. Right? Remember that? Or maybe in 20, you know, 2012, if only he gets reelected, then he'll be able to really be himself. There are no saviors. Franklin Roosevelt was governor of New York before he became president of the United States. FDR, the guy that I don't think anybody could successfully argue that FDR didn't save this country. And I'm not talking about World War II. I'm talking about the Great Depression. FDR saved this country. And he created the modern uh, social democracy, whatever you want to call it, democratic socialist if you want, I know that the right wingers will go nuts if I use that phrase, but there, you know, there is some truth to that. You know, social security, the right to unionize. These are things where society's needs are at concern as much as any individual's needs, and therefore qualify as being at least in some small way socialist rather than libertarian, rather than just, you know, hey, I got mine, screw you. FDR, the president, with the help of Francis Perkins, his secretary of labor, and the new biography about her is really worth reading. FDR saved this country. <coughs> Excuse me. As governor of New York, his attorney general, whose name I don't recall, merrily let Wall Street get away with incredible amounts of criminal activity in 1928 and 29. Actually, I should go back and look at the years. I'm not sure what years he was governor of New York. But the, 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 the fact of the matter is that he was governor of New York when it was an incredibly corrupt state, which included right up until 1932. And he could have been a, just another corrupt president. It wasn't FDR who saved America. It was the people. It was we the people 
I write about this in my book, The Crash of 20, 2012, I went, or 2016. I went back and read the New York Times archives from 1933, from March of 1933. I read day by day by day, and I read uh, most, I started with March of 33 when FDR was sworn into office and read right through most of that year. Spent weeks doing this. And there was a, a woman reporter, and I'm forgetting her name, and this is all in my book, in the, in the crash of 2016. There was a woman reporter who had, she was one of the very first female reporters of the New York Times. She was a real force to be reckoned with. And she was writing these front page headline all the way across the top stories about the early FDR administration in the first hundred days. And she chronicled how every member of Congress was buried in paper. Their offices were buried in paper from the telegrams that were coming in from all over the country from people saying, give him whatever he wants. FDR said, I'm going to reinvent this country. We're going to make it, a, we're going to remake it anew. You'll recall he said, you know, to some generations, much is given of other generations, much is asked. This generation has a rendezvous with destiny. People think he was talking about World War II. No, that, that was from his inaugural address. He was talking about the Great Depression. And the people overwhelmingly said, do it! And he did it. And so that's why I don't think, you know, I, I think around the margins, it matters if the president is Hillary Clinton or, or Elizabeth Warren. I think going into it, it matters probably in a much larger way. And certainly the president can screw things up. Just look at George W. Bush or Ronald Reagan. But if we, the people, are active enough and strong enough, it doesn't matter who's in that office. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 866-987-THOM. Because we will make them do it right. And case in point, Republican Dwight Eisenhower. 